This is lecture one for unit four of biology 101. And this unit is over the cell. And we begin talking about microscopy. Microscopy is the science of magnifying small things with the use of a microscope to enlarge them, to better able to see them and study them. In our classes and our labs at the main campus and the ed centers, we use light microscopes. We use different light microscopes and uh, use them in different ways. Generally, we use what's called the bright field uh, option on the microscope, and uh, we light up the image and the field and uh, whatever the object is, we usually cast a shadow. Sometimes in microbiology, when we're wanting to see small creatures in a liquid environment, we'll use what is called phase contrast microscopy. And that's where we put the light slightly out of, out of phase. And it affects how the light hits and refracts from the cells and things that are in the cells. It helps the little creatures to show up better. Light microscopy, the upper magnification limits for this type of microscopy would be about 1,000 to 1,500 times magnification. And the problem is, if you go up much past 1,000 times, you start piling up the light rays on top of each other. And instead of an image becoming clearer as you increase magnification, it actually becomes less clear. You lose what's called resolution, the ability to distinguish two points or two things that you're, you're looking at. They just seem to, to go together. The neat thing about using the light microscope is that you can view living specimens and specimens that are moving. Sometimes we move the slide so that we can chase the little creatures that we're looking at underneath the cover slip on a microscope slide. The scanning electron microscope, and uh, I have an image here for you, and also in the file, you should be able to click on this hyperlink that says image, and it should take you to the web page where I copied this image of the electron microscope. This happens to be a scanning electron microscope. The scanning electron microscope will magnify many, many more times than the light microscope. At least it's able to. Sometimes uh, the magnification will be similar to a light microscope, but uh, thousands of times uh, or even 10,000 times magnification with the scanning electron microscope. One of the things to keep in mind if you're wanting to use a scanning electron microscope, because it's an electron microscope and it's the electrons that are being captured and moving and helping to form an image. And they're very fast. You don't have to be concerned about piling them up at uh, piling the, white, uh, the light waves up on top of each other like you would with a light microscope. At least the magnifications we would use. Uh, not that problem, but your specimen has to be uh, stationary. It cannot be alive. It can't be moving. And the scanning electron microscope, as its name implies, is for scanning surfaces. It wouldn't be for seeing inside the cells, but on the surface. And it used to be that they would use a solution of silver chloride and coat the surface so it would have a little bit better reflection of the electrons. The transmission electron microscope, and I have an image here for you to see, is much more powerful than the scanning electron microscope. Like the other type of electron microscope, the specimen has to be dead. It cannot be moving. But the transmission electron microscope can see inside the cells, organelles, and, and even molecules. With the transmission electron microscope, pictures have even been taken of large atoms such as uranium. It would appear fuzzy, gray and fuzzy, and there's, there's nothing distinct about it because of the movement of electrons. But they have uh, used it for very high magnification, hundreds of thousands of times. And one of the problems is when you're magnifying that many times, that great magnification, you have to have everything very still. And so even a heat and cooling unit in a building can set up so much vibration that it renders the electron microscope unusable. So a lot of times they have to baffle any motion that might be inherent in the floor and the, the structure of the building. When we think about the size of the cell, you generally think of something that is microscopic. 
it's beyond what we can see with the unaided eye. We have to have aid in seeing most cells. There are some exceptions, and I've shown some here in this image. You can see there's a chicken egg over on the right, and there's an ostrich egg over on the left. If these were unfertilized, they would represent a single cell. That's a that's a, an extreme, each one would be. Generally, when you think of cells, they, they're beyond what we can see. But there are some eggs that, if they're unfertilized, you can see them. If you walk by a pond here in the next month, or a, a body of water, you might see eggs from an amphibian. It could be from a frog or a toad, maybe some salamanders. If you were to happen along as the eggs are being laid and before they're fertilized, those would represent single cells. The human ovum is large enough for a person to see it. If you know, knew what you were looking for and you, you could separate it out from other tissue, from other cells, you sh should, you're supposed to be able to see it. But uh, these would be the extremes. There are some cells in the body, nerve cells in the legs, especially large uh, mammals, that can be feet in length, but generally we think of them as being microscopic. One of the things that's true about um, cells, they are limited by the surface area and uh, the volume. It's, there's this uh, surface area to volume ratio that becomes important. Small cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio. As you increase the size of the cell, say like a, an ostrich egg, the volume increases at a much faster rate than the surface area. And the surface area is important because that's how nutrients and oxygen, things are needed by the cell to enter and waste leave. So that tends to limit the size of cells. I don't have a picture here, but in my face-to-face -face class, I show a picture to my students of a giant and uh, a person that uh, appears to be small in their adult size, maybe three feet tall. And they're standing next to each other. Perhaps uh, they were performers in a circus. There's a tent in the background. But I'll ask students, are their blood cells the same size? And that's a, a quandary for some students because they think that the smaller human, even though he would be an adult, would have smaller red blood cells. I said, well, no. Uh, I usually ask it with another question. I encourage students to ask themselves questions. When you give blood, or if you are the recipient of blood, do they label it giant blood or average size person blood or baby blood? And usually students will say, no, they don't. That's true. Red blood cells are red blood cells. The volume of blood would be much greater in a larger person than in a smaller person. But the surface area to volume ratio tends to limit the size of cells. If you're going to look at cells and study them, it helps to have a microscope. In the late 1500s, very close to 1600, there was a Johann Janssen and a Zacharias Janssen, I think it's Zacharias that's actually given credit, with inventing the first microscope. And my understanding is that they lived in what would be present-day Belgium, somewhat in northern and western Europe. Um, what used to be part of the, the Netherlands. And this is supposed to be an image of one of those early microscopes, or at least what it looked like. It was just a uh, elongated tube with lenses in it that helped to magnify. Into the 1600s, a person by the name of uh, Robert Hooke was uh, using the microscope. He studied cork cells and he actually named the little rectangular boxes that we today understand are cells. He actually named them cells. He's the first one to use that term cell. A little bit later in uh, the 1600s, Von Leeuwenhoek, and some of these guys I've had you study in the past, I think maybe in the first unit with the history of biology, but Von Leeuwenhoek uh, produced a number of microscopes, ground his own lenses, and they were superior to any of the microscopes before and for many years afterwards. Louis Pasteur used microscopy and studied a number of microbes, determined a number of microbial diseases, and um, helped further 
the study of microbiology and microscopy in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. When we're talking about cells, we oftentimes divide cells, types of cells, into two main groups, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. It helps if you understand the prefixes. Prokaryote, that pro, means before, before nucleus, the karyo has to do with nucleus. You, that prefix you, whenever you see that, that means true. The eukaryotic organisms have a true nucleus. When you think of prokaryotes, think of bacteria, and all the other organisms would be classified as eukaryotes. If you read scientific journals, sometimes you'll come across these terms, and it helps to understand that. Through this list below, you can see, perhaps it's small print, but the, the bacteria, the prokaryotes, do not have a true nucleus. They have no membrane-bound organelles. They have a single chromosome, and um, they do not undergo mitosis for cell division. Their flagella are very simple in their makeup, in their construction, as compared to eukaryotic flagella. Their ribosomes are smaller and uh, they have no histone proteins. The, they do, almost all bacteria have a cell wall and there's no cellulose in their cell wall. They have a chemical called peptidoglycan. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. They do have membrane-bound organelles. The chromosomes occur in pairs and that's important because when you have pairs of chromosomes you can have a gene on one chromosome that's recessive and a gene on another chromosome that's dominant. You don't have that with bacteria. You, the gene is there or it's not there. If it's there, it's generally expressed. We can have genes in our chromosomes that are not expressed. We do not have a, we don't show a phenotype because it's masked over by the dominant gene in many cases. There can be streaming in the cytoplasm. I'll show a picture in a little bit of a chloroplast, a chloroplast in a cell, and those chloroplasts can actually move around the edge of the cell sometimes referred to as cyclosis or cell streaming. Cell division occurs with the help of mitosis. If there are any flagella on eukaryotic cells, they're more complex than bacterial flagella. Eukaryotic ribosomes are larger, more complex, and uh, eukaryotic cells have a, a complex cytoskeleton. If uh, you're talking about plants, plants have cellulose in their cell walls. Uh, fungi have chitin in their cell walls. Animal cells have no cell wall. And there are histones, a certain type of protein associated with the DNA in eukaryotic cells. And there's a difference in size usually. There, there are some exceptions, but generally bacteria are smaller, eukaryotic cells are larger. And you can find exceptions where things in this list don't, do not show up in a eukaryotic cell. A good example would be a red blood cell. Red blood cell is not nucleated in mammals, humans included whereas in fish and amphibians it would be nucleated. We also consider differences between the animal cell and the plant cell. Uh, generally you think about uh, flagella, centrioles, and lysosomes possibly being present in an animal cell but not in a plant cell. In a plant cell you'll have a cell wall that has cellulose in its makeup, a vacuole, and that vacuole can be quite large. It, um, it can take up 80% or more of the volume of the cell in some cases. And many plants have chloroplasts. That's for photosynthesis, transforming light energy into chemical energy. Animal cells do not have cell walls or chloroplasts, and usually we don't think of them as having vacuoles. I'll continue on some of the cell parts, organelles, in the next video.